Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. On the morning of October 29, 1988, the University of Hawaii's research vessel Moana Wave set sail, embarking on the very first oceanographic research expedition of the Hawaii Ocean Time Series program, often referred to by its acronym HOT. This program was developed by researchers in the newly created School of Ocean and Earth Science and Technology. Roger Lucas and David Carl, professors in the Department of Oceanography, spearheaded this effort and led the first expedition to Station Aloha. Located 60 nautical miles to the north of the island of Oahu, Hawaii, Station Aloha lies in the open ocean in the largest ecosystem on the planet, the North Pacific Subtropical Gyre. The primary objective of the HOT program was to obtain a long-term time series to provide a comprehensive description of the physical and biogeochemical parameters of the ocean at a location characteristic of the gyre. Yeah, what some people will do for a little exercise. This is research in Manoa. We're talking about the Hawaiian Ocean Time Series. It's hot. 30th anniversary today, part two. Okay, with Dave Carl and Evangelique White. So, you guys, uh, the first thing is, you know, it dawns on me as a curious person how you pay for all this. How is this funded? Because, you know, taking the ship out there, even though it, I suppose it's rented rather than owned because it's a Navy ship, um, how do you how do you pay for all that equipment, all those uh, all those scientific research experiments, whatnot? Well, in a nutshell, with great effort, <laughs> but also with uh, great uh, generosity of a number of uh, agencies. Uh, first and foremost is the taxpayers of this uh, great country. The National Science Foundation is one of the government agencies that has uh, been supporting our research at Station Aloha since the beginning. Uh, in addition to that, we've had private support from the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation, and uh, most recently uh, fr from the Simons Foundation with a program called SCOPE, the Simons Collaboration on Ocean Processes and Ecology. And uh, last but certainly not least is the, is the state of Hawaii, the University of Hawaii. Uh, we are a public university. Uh, I am a professor, Angelique is a professor. Uh, we get our salaries from the state and we use some of that uh, support to conduct our uh, basic research in the ocean. And so it's this uh, a tripartite of uh, private, uh, public, and university partnership uh, that has supported our work for so many years. And it, it doesn't uh, come cheaply. The, the research vessel that you saw in these videos is uh, roughly forty to $45,000 a day, uh, depending on which uh, vessel you use. And that, demands that we work efficiently, that we work around the clock, 24-7 if we're on our longer cruises, 24-4 uh, for our typical hot cruise, which is four days long. Mm -hmm. People are working very hard, and we have two shifts, typically 12-hour uh, shifts, and that's how we conduct our research at sea. Wow, that's impressive. You know, people think, oh, it's just a, a lot of research, and somebody comes in and pays for it. No, it's complicated. You know, you have to get the equipment, you have to schedule everything, you have to marshal your assets, and then you have to raise the money to pay for, and, and then you have to write it up, make sense of it, and, 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 and make it work for humanity. Uh, complicated, how do you sleep at night? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, it's better not to sleep because then you're working 24 hours a go. day and you get more done. But um, yeah, I can sleep at night knowing that there's a great team of people uh, affiliated with the Hawaii Ocean Time Series program. and also with the SCOPE program. These are dedicated uh, scientists, students, technicians, administrators. We have uh, all sorts of people working on our teams. Uh, and we've had some people, uh, if you can believe this, Jay, that, that were affiliated with HOT1 in October 1988, yeah. that went out on HOT1, and they're still involved no in kidding. working with the program. That's amazing. We've had uh, four of our uh, top um, uh, technical staff who have been on 200 or more hot cruises, and we just recently celebrated one of our colleagues, uh, Blake Watkins, who went on 100 consecutive hot cruises. That's 10 <laughs> years it's without crazy. missing the beat. And, uh, you know, he missed the, the, the anniversaries and the holidays and the pet's birthdays and everything else <laughs> just to go out to Station Aloha and get that last uh, data point. Yeah. So, Angelique, let's talk about the shipboard life. Let's talk about the life of a scientist who goes out there. 
um, four days every month, some mm -hmm. people 100, 100 visits. Um, and altogether, you've done, th what, am I right, 307 trips out there yeah. in these 30 years. That's quite amazing. So what is it like? Um, you know, what, what, you have a laboratory on board. There's uh, several laboratories on board. Oh, is that right? So I think you've seen from that video that there's, a, like I said, there's 12-hour shifts, right? So there's not a lot of downtime. And in those 12 hours that you're off, there's sleep and there's, there's other work to be done. Um, so in those 12-hour shifts, you've got teams that are working on various aspects of the cruise mission itself. Um, you have people that are deploying and recovering instruments. You have people that are filtering water in the lab. You have people that are running instruments in the belly of the ship itself. You've got people that are watch leaders that are coordinating this concert of sampling that's happening over this time period. And all of this has to be done in a very safe way because, as you've seen, um, when we can be out at sea, sometimes conditions can be rough. It can be dangerous to be standing on the edge of, of the ship trying to bring in a heavy instrument. So it all has to be done quite Anybody safely. Anybody get seasick? Absolutely. Certainly, <laughs> the people get seasick. Um, I've been seasick many times myself. Is that right? Yes, okay. absolutely. It goes away after a day or so sure for most of us, but not for everybody. Um, so, yeah, you have to work through inclement weather. You have to uh, work through... Um, you know, any number of challenges that come with having these floating laboratories at sea. And now, not, it certainly wasn't always the case, but you can actually communicate with shore nowadays. Uh, back in the day, maybe you got no email at all mm. while you were at oh, sea. Oh, you get email. Right. How about email? send videos and photo photographs? Send, depending on the ship, you can send videos and photographs depending on the coverage at that time. But that's also important because there's a huge array of instruments that we're also watching. So. You saw in that video some of these things go overboard. Well, we need to know where they go, oh. right? So that's a part of the at-sea communications. There are other instruments. There are gliders. There are autonomous instruments. There are satellites that are passing by. And a whole range of in instrumentation that you need to keep track of during the cruise itself. This is like going into space and, and gathering information about yeah. everything in every direction, yeah. embracing, as I said, the, you yeah. know, the whole environment. So I, what do you, what's the payload? When you come back, is it... Is it a little disk about the size of a USB, and, <laughs> and that's all the data you got when you went? What, what do you bring back? Certainly there is data. There's an enormous amount of data, and now we can store them on smaller and smaller sticks, right? But there's also a lot of water samples. Um, there's water samples that have been put through filters. There are samples of whole organisms that are collected in net toes. Um, and a lot of other streams of data that, in the end, you have to coordinate what this means for that individual cruise, but more importantly, how that stacks up to now this 30-year, which if we're in a 150-year-old field, is a fifth of the time series of all of oceanography, as we've learned as a component of the Hawaiian we're Ocean Time Series. Pushing the envelope We're pushing the time. envelope, absolutely. And it's incredibly important that that data which spans core data, so the things that we collect on every single cruise, to data that um, is supporting uh, research for other scientists that are participating in these cruises, to data from the autonomous instruments, that they all be very high quality and quality controlled. Yeah. That's then, a very key important part. The delta factor, that's as much as I know about it. Yeah. So uh, there were 60 articles submitted to the uh, Journal of uh, Limnology and Ocean Oceanography this yeah. morning, yep. your 30th anniversary submission, yeah. so to say. Um, pick one, tell me about one, and try to do it so that a, a person not skilled in this kind of mi microbial science would understand at least some of it. <laughs> I, I looked through them, you know, and I'm sorry. You didn't have a favorite? I need help. You didn't have a favorite? Um, it's hard to pick a favorite, and, and these are all um, papers that have been published over the last few decades in one particular journal, the Limnology and Oceanography. Um, there are many that uh, Dave has already mentioned covers the base of the food web up to higher trophic levels. But I'd say one of my favorites involves understanding the concept called ocean acidification, um, which arguably is, is fairly well known in the general public. So there's these seasonal cycles of the ocean breathing in carbon and oxygen and breathing out, right? So you're seeing carbon from the atmosphere being brought into the ocean as a function both of chemistry but predominantly biology. And layered on top of that seasonal cycle of, you know, ocean metabolism and breath, we're starting to see a buildup of certain chemicals in the surface ocean that 
effectively, or what we term oh. ocean acidification. So we're seeing the increase in carbon in the atmosphere is now being reflected in the increase in carbon I in the ocean. I heard you say breathing, and breathing. what it told me was the ocean is is organic, it's, it's a person. Yeah, it's alive. You know, it's, it's alive, yeah. it breathes, and you can watch that. What a thrill. The Pacific Ocean, My the largest ecosystem. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what is your advice to Evangelique going forward as a principal investigator? Well, the, the main thing is to, to sustain the collaboration of science as a team sport, and uh, arguably we've got the best team, you know, better than the Boston Red Sox, I would say. <laughs> um, that is something yeah, right now. <laughs> we've got the best team on the planet. And that, that team spirit and collaborative uh, nature of the work we do needs to be sustained. Yeah. It's not something that comes natural for scientists. Uh, Basically, scientists tend to be uh, isolationists. They're individuals. They're sometimes egotists. Um, major discoveries aren't really necessarily made by teams. They're made by individuals. So there's this dichotomy in science between doing your own thing and being part of a larger team where the, the, the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. And that's really what we tried to build in, at Station Aloha, both in the HOT program and the Seymour program and now in the SCOPE program. It's much more fun, I think, to do work together than alone. That's my own view. And I would leave uh, Angelique with that uh, advice to uh, sustain and improve the collaboration mm -hmm. that we've built already, because I think that's the future. Other people uh, need to approve our work and, and, mm -hmm. and sustain it through funding cycles, through proposal writing, and. And if uh, people aren't uh, supportive of the work you're doing because it's not inclusive, then that works against you in the long run. So I think by opening the door, I mean, ALOHA, this acronym we have, and I, we didn't mention that, but the acronym is a long-term oligotrophic habitat assessment. But it's this uh, d double entendre, the, the, the welcoming, the gathering of, of science at a place in the ocean uh, that we've created, I think, is, is just this... Uh, it's a metaphor for success. It's perfect. Uh, it's perfect. And that's that. Um, what, what was the position exactly? 2245, 158 West. Okay. Uh, and you that's can, a little tiny place it's, about it's, the size it's maybe. It's a crossroads a... Of, 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 <laughs> of ocean science, and it's a benchmark uh, for discovery. Yep. Uh, you know, you were asking about the papers. I, I think one thing that's very important uh, if your uh, viewers are, are planning to go to the, and we're going to have this on the website, the URL to get you to this uh, virtual issue, reprinted articles from Station Aloha, the one-stop shopping, if you will. It's really important to look at that list of publications, and uh, just about every one is multi-authored. By that I mean it has more than one uh, author, more than one contributor. That's what I mean by scientific collaboration. And oftentimes there'd be four or five people. Mm -hmm. And it's, 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 these are the people that work together, bring ideas to the table, argue about the interpretations, and come up with a product that would be better than if any one individual were to publish it. And, uh, you know, the, the, the basis for that is, is working together at Station Aloha. What a great thing you've done, Dave. Dave is a member of the uh, National Academy of Science, and uh, that's very prestigious and unique around here. So it's um, great to have you develop this. It's great to have Seymour. It's great to have HOT. And uh, boy, you're going to have to step in some big shoes. I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> They're actually <laughs> small. <laughs> no, anyway, you guys, uh, why don't we close with that last clip you wanted to show, Dave? Um, this what a couple of minutes. Let's take a look at that last video that you wanted to show. Okay, let's take a look at the gliders because one of the things that we've been uh, looking at for the future is autonomous sampling of the ocean. Right now, we're basically a ship-based program, and we'll never replace the research vessel as our main platform for sample recovery and observations. But we've been for the last uh, five or six years, we've been uh, flying these so-called autonomous underwater vehicles. These are drones, if you will, that we put into the ocean. You see this deployment on a, on a midnight at Station Aloha. 
Uh, these can stay out for three months, collecting data when the ship is not out at the station. And these gliders go up and down in the water column from the surface down to about six or 700 meters. And every time they surface, they broadcast a string of data back to our laboratories at the University of Hawaii. This shows one of them, the behavior underwater. And they can stay out, as I said, for three months collecting data. We can run a whole fleet of these. We've got uh, five or six of them now in the, in the inventory. And this is something that we hope to build additional assets in the future, including possibly an autonomous surface ship that we're now just starting some early discussions. So maybe the future uh, Station Aloha cruise will involve uh, a, a group of pilots sitting at a laboratory at the University of Hawaii driving an autonomous ship out to Station Aloha, sending a CTD down, collecting water samples, filtering, and bringing them back to the dock where the scientists can do the downstream analysis. Uh, we don't think that'll happen in any time soon, but certainly in Angelique's white uh, lifetime. Uh, she's a young, early career scientist with uh, another uh, generation of, uh, of research to go. Yeah. Your 30 years starts right now. I know, Angelique. my 30 years starts right now, yeah, and these autonomous instruments are absolutely a, a component moving forward between the, the gliders and drones and profiling floats and a whole range of other instrumentation. Well, there it is. It's, um, it's embracing the ocean in all particulars, in everything we can think of. It's using the best technology we have and that we can find as going forward, always always using better instruments, better technology to measure things, and finally delivering it back for the benefit of humanity. Absolutely. No small thing. Thank you so much, Dave Carl. Great to have you here. Jay, it's uh, great to be with uh, Think Tech Hawaii once again. Angelique White, great to have you here. Thank you, you so here, much. Guys. Good luck for the next 30. Appreciate it. Aloha. <laughs>